such as grub control. So if you scout and you find grubs, you, you know, you have to know where they typically are year after year. So I think that before you do testing and scouting, you have to, what my sound bite to the people I talk to is know your enemy. Know your diseases, your insects and weeds, why they're coming in, where they're coming in, and whether or not you need to do anything about it. And I'll just say that we have this battle back and forth with the Scots because they say that's all fine, but a lot of people, like say 60% of the market are, are going to, they already think they know their enemy and they want to kill it. So, I mean, and our job is to make sure that they don't kill the water supply, one of our jobs. You know, so whatever you buy, make sure you sweep it off the sidewalk. But I agree with you. I think that's really good. And I think, I like what Jeff um, Rousseau had done with, here's, here's our brand and go to our website for tons more information. But in the meantime, if you're in the store, you're looking for something to deal with ants, here's our fact sheet that says, here are all the least toxic ways of dealing with it. So, I and I think you know the example from California was good too. With, you know the, the posters, ants, aphids, uh, real clear. And I wish our extension guide sheet sheets were that sexy. Yeah. And this, <laughs> you know, I, concern, IPM, I worry is going to go the way of um, a maximum economic yield and B, BMPs, best management practices. They got so overused. Everything got pulled into it. Pretty much best management practices now means management practice. Mm -hmm. The best part has been totally lost. Anything you do in an agricultural field, somebody will call a BMP now. So it's a useless phrase. Keep an idea of what IPM is, I think is really important. How it differs from what's not IPM. Um, because it's a good term and it's it's got buzz and we want to keep that buzz, but to keep it they got to defend the concept of what is not IPM. What is IPM at work? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was going to make a comment, just not to muddy the water, but states have taken it upon themselves individually I, uh, to find IPM. And so what is IPM in Maryland is not IPM in Pennsylvania. It's not IPM in New Jersey. And so we even have a definition problem with that basic, very, that very basic skill set. It's not the same thing, state by state. What is what, what's the definition for IPM? I'll come back to that. There are more weeds than thin lines. <laughs> Let's see, thin lawns, more weeds, require more herbicides. Is this a good trade-off? That's more of a question than a key message. Uh, issue of responsibility of water quality in the environment. Personal responsibility, I think. Personal responsibility. Ring of responsibility was a great trade. Yeah, that was a good The ring of responsibility. I can't remember who raised, who raised. We have a trademark on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was talking more about this group. When I said that, I was talking more about this group. I think yeah. before we come up with a collaborative message, we had to come up with a collaborative idea of what our responsibility as an industry is to educate the homeowner. Mm -hmm. Do we have a responsibility to educate the homeowner? Why do we feel that we have that responsibility? And then talk about how we're going to do it. But you can also take responsibility to talk about the fact that before we even before we even educate the homeowner owner about their effects on water quality, we have to remind them that they have an effect on water quality. Because right now there is such a disconnect between what people do in their backyard and how it affects the environment. If we don't bridge that gap, if, if we don't get them reconnected to that concept, then all of these target keywords and tag points that we're talking about are not going to mean anything. Right, and I think that was the impetus for this conference, is the water quality people were trying to make the connection, a lot of times pointing to the turf, and the turf group is out there making their own set of recommendations, which may or may not have included environmental considerations. So there's a lot of but stuff, I think Jeff Rousseau, again, this example is pretty darn good. I mean, why, why did they start doing what they're doing? Because they found the pesticides in the water. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the reasons of having this conference. How much nitrogen is getting into the water? How much phosphorus is getting into the water? We 
we just touched the surface of that. But, but again, all of these messages all have to do with turf grass. Yeah. None of them yeah. have to do with the environment. None of the taglines that anybody said after that turf oh, conference see, yesterday, see none of them had to do with the environment. They all had to do with a message about turf grass science. Well, and I, I kind of think, I think there was one. I don't know if anybody agrees with <laughs> that. I think there was one that healthy lawns is good for the environment. Right. Right. And I, I think that. What does that mean to a homeowner? Yeah. That to a homeowner that means I need to put more product on my lawn so it gets healthy. I, I'm not sure that's true. Well, I, I think you have to have to really study it. I, I think they get so many sound bites and, and information, and I won't classify it as misinformation. It's different people that I think a lot of people are confused that growing a lawn is acceptable and, and it's not just detrimental to the environment i think you can say healthy landscapes are environmentally sound and that incorporates in the, the plants and, and as well as the turtles i think healthy healthy management practices is good for the environment that i think that would be a better well, yeah and, and we can twist it a lot of ways but so often what we read we hear from all kinds of external stakeholders is that somehow if you manage plants it's not good. It, it's almost like the hand of man is somehow bad and evil for the environment. And we get into these discussions on, oh, is a prairie okay? Everybody goes, yeah, a prairie's okay. Well, how about a park? Well, a park might be okay. Well, what if it's mowed and, and fertilized? Well, we're not quite so sure. And then when you get to the home lawn, it's almost the far extreme. So, uh, you know, I, I guess what I, I'm after is seeing it, it, it that there's value to green space. And that's a message that homeowners are not hearing from this community whatsoever. And it's sociological benefits, it's environmental benefits, it's economic benefits, there's all kinds of benefits that a good landscape has. And we don't really talk that much about it. But that's not what this conference was about, though. This conference was about the fact that we all think that turf grass is beneficial to the environment. But we all accept the responsibility that what we do impacts the environment. So how can we bring that message forward? Well, I think that's what part of the discussion about whether, when we looked at all the data yesterday, whether or not maintaining turf grass, which was where most of the data was, was uh, adverse to the environment or not, and what the potential impacts were on different ways to do it. Wait, would you just restate your question, Sadie, so I can write it down and make sure that it gets heard? What? Say what you said again. I said so many things. <laughs> <laughs> thing. Well, you know, he's saying that his tagline would be that a healthy lawn is beneficial to the environment. Or, and the thing is, is that's not what this conference was about, because if that's, if that's just fine, then we could have all gone home yesterday after lunch. What, what we're here about today is that we all agree that a healthy landscape is good for the environment, but we also accept the responsibility that how we manage that landscape affects the environment. So we need to bring the message forth about how we affect it in a positive way and not a negative way. Right, what are the areas that we know are concerns? I mean, I keep going back to it because it's so damn obvious that getting uh, product on the sidewalk. And I think a lot of people don't realize that that goes right into the storm I could pick that one. Is that right? Is that a good example? Or yeah, it's, it's more like, it's part of a just to, we just need to be aware that there are issues. It's right. not all just a healthy lap. I don't think we'd be there if we did. Yeah. Whether, whether we want to admit it or not, in Connecticut, we are finding more and more and more media, letters to the editor, the Saturday talk show environmentalists chastising people that have good lawns. And they're, and they're saying, if you have a good lawn, you're hurting the environment. And that's definitely not true. And I think that's where he's coming from there. We have to acknowledge somewhere along the line 
that there's nothing wrong with having a good lawn. Well, wait, wait, wait. wait. We've, we've heard science on both sides of the issue. I think Kevin Frank, who is a lawn guy, said, in fact, we find if you put too much nitrogen on, it goes into the groundwater. That's a concern. I mean, that's what Sadie's saying. So there's there's two sides, and our job is to present. But that's the argument no, works, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, sure. I think what he's saying is if it's done responsibly, and I agree. I think everyone agrees you can you can go to both sides of the extreme. The real question is, we need to define and educate for the consumers what is the, the proper way to take care of it. Just don't 